So moving forward, let's take up the next question that is question number 7. Let the function f defined by fx equals x cube minus x square plus x minus 1 times sin x and g be any arbitrary function. It is given. Now product fg that is fx into gx be the product function obviously the same then which of the following statements is our true multiple answer type right so let's understand if g is continuous at x equals 1 then fg is differentiable if fg is differentiable then g is continuous reverse of the first part third and fourth what they are saying if g is differentiable at x equals 1 then fg is differentiable if fg is differentiable at x equals 1 then g is differentiable let's understand what the question is actually demanding you have function fx given by x square into x minus 1 plus x minus 1 into sin x correct we have to talk about differentiability of the product fg at x equals 1 so let's understand with the differentiability of product fg first fg x and its derivative at x equals 1 this is limit h approaching to 0 fg 1 minus h we can also talk about right hand limit only first then later we can talk about left hand limit so let's understand we are going with the first principle basically considering it is differentiable so this minus fg 1 divided by h this is clear now this is equal to limit h approaching to 0 product fg fx is this one from where we can take x minus 1 common instead of x we have to put 1 plus h so it is 1 plus h minus 1 that is simply h multiplied with x square plus sin x put here 1 plus h so 1 plus h whole square plus sin 1 plus h correct minus we have to get the value at 1 when you put here x equals 1 this is 0 so whatever be the value of g it is going to be 0 only into g of 1 plus h minus 0 because the value of this fx when you say x equals 1 it becomes 0 this becomes 0 so whatever be g1 it is not going to make any difference divided by h now this term exists finitely because i am considering this function is differentiable at x equals 1 correct h is cancelled so we are getting limit h approaching to 0 1 plus h whole square plus sine 1 plus h this can be well defined by substituting the limit this gives you 1 plus sine 1 multiplied with g of 1 plus h this exists finitely when you are saying this term similarly when you go with the left hand derivative part what you will be getting left hand derivative will be giving you limit h approaching to 0 1 plus sine 1 in the same manner multiplied with g of 1 minus h let's check why i'm saying so in the same manner here when you put x as 1 minus h you will be getting minus h only in denominator also you have minus h so minus h is cancelled this is clear on applying limit this remaining part will give you 1 minus h whole square plus sine 1 minus h am i clear on it all right so clearly we can say it implies that limit h approaching to 0 g of 1 plus h is equal to limit h approaching to 0 g of 1 minus h now what is the conclusion from this statement that g of 1 plus h is equal to g of 1 minus h under the limit h approaching to 0 it means limit of the function gx exists at x equals 1 what can we say about continuity nothing what can we say about differentiability nothing so what we are concluding here if that function fg is differentiable limit exists this is clear i can't say anything about continuity and differentiability but if the reverse case is true meaning this is continuous 
meaning this will be equal to g1 now when these two are equal obviously this is differentiable we have seen next if g is differentiable obviously when it is differentiable meaning it is continuous meaning the limit is existing so yes what we are concluding over here we got the conclusion as if g is continuous then fg is differentiable yes if fg is differentiable then g is continuous no if g is differentiable then fg is differentiable yes fg is differentiable then g is differentiable no so the correct answers for this question we are getting option a and c from this multiple answer type i'm sure this is clear let's take up the next one question number eight let m be a three by three invertible matrix with real entries and let i denote three by three identity matrix if m inverse is adjoint of adjoint m then which of the following statements is r always true let's understand we can use the identity adjoint m into adjoint of adjoint m is equal to determinant of adjoint m into identity matrix because we have a adjoint a is determinant a into identity correct now we also know that determinant of adjoint of adjoint a what is that determinant a whole to the power n minus 1 whole square right also we have determinant of here we have m instead of a so let's write down in the similar fashion this is determinant m whole 2 to the power 2 so that is giving me determinant m whole 4 this is clear all right now if i multiply this equation by m what is going to happen m adjoint m that means when you are multiplying with m you will be getting m into adjoint m that is determinant m into identity which can go with this term itself adjoint of adjoint m is equal to determinant of adjoint m meaning determinant m whole square into m determinant m whole square into m this is clear now look back what the question is talking about we have used so many equations it is given m inverse is adjoint of adjoint m correct now adjoint of adjoint m is given by this one meaning determinant of m inverse now when you use this equation what's the result determinant m whole 5 is 1 so let's write down here we get determinant m from here determinant m is equal to 1 the value of determinant m is 1 put it here so what you will be getting you are getting adjoint of adjoint m is equal to m which is given to us m inverse so what's the next conclusion m inverse and m are equal now time to look at the option so that we can understand that what we are doing over here determinant m is 1 this is correct there is no problem with this answer so let's go for it determinant m is 1 next m square is i meaning m is m inverse so multiply by m m square is equal to m into m inverse that is i yes this is also correct next adjoint m whole square is i what is adjoint m let's check out we can say since m into adjoint m is equal to determinant m into identity matrix the value of determinant m is 1 so we have m adjoint m is i this is clear now when you say let's write down m adjoint m is i let's multiply it by m inverse so we have m inverse m into adjoint m is m inverse correct m inverse or you can call it m again because both are same so finally we have adjoint m is equal to m correct now what the question is talking about question is saying adjoint m whole square 
obviously at joint time whole square will become m square let's write down implies that at joint m whole square is m square which we have already proved as i because this is m into m inverse so yes option d is also correct so i'm sure this is clear option a obviously it is not correct because we have not obtained this term so let's write down the correct possible options for this question b c d time to move on to the next question that is question number nine let s be the set of all complex numbers satisfying mod z square plus z plus one is equal to one then which of the following statements is r true let's understand how we can start it mod z square plus z plus one is equal to one or mod z plus half whole square plus three by four is equal to one now modulus of something is given to me we have inequality when you have modulus of z1 plus z2 you can say this is lying between difference of two individual moduli and sum of the two individual moduli that means you are saying mod z plus half whole square minus 3 by 4 mod z plus half whole square plus 3 by 4 we can put here one later less than equal to mod z plus half whole square plus 3 by 4 this is clear this term is z1 this term is z2 so z1 minus z2 z1 plus z2 now middle term this is equal to 1 as we it is already given to us so what we are getting if you take the first two you have mod of z plus half whole square it is less than 7 by 4 or equal to it is greater than equal to what we are getting 1 by 4 so it's greater than equal to 1 by 4 this is the result we are obtaining from here we can say z plus half its modulus it is between root 7 by 2 and 1 by 2 time to look at the options we can see the first one is saying less than equal to half not true but clearly option c is true we have to talk about option b let's check mod of z plus half is less than equal to root 7 upon 2 so here again we can say by using the inequality that this term z plus half its modulus it is lying between mod z minus half to mod z plus half this is clear so this is lying this term is lying between mod z minus half to mod z plus half we can put the close interval as well now obviously this value is less than equal to root 7 by 2 so maximum value obtained is mod z is less than equal to root 7 plus 1 upon 2 clearly this value is less than 2 so yes from the given options now we can conclude that option b is also correct so b and c clearly these two are correct and a is clearly wrong time to think about option d the set s has exactly four elements in fact this will have infinitely many cases but if we look at it just consider modulus of z square plus z plus one is equal to one if you just consider say these two are zero so one equals one is satisfied meaning if you are considering z square plus z equals zero you are getting two possible solutions zero minus one correct if you consider these two zero you are getting mod z equals one z square plus 1 equals 0 meaning z is plus minus iota that is also satisfying the case so z equals 0 minus 1 plus minus iota in the similar fashion you can go with minus 1 plus minus iota again you can verify yes it has more than four solutions it is very evident so yes option b and c are the correct options time to write down the correct answers this is b and c i'm sure this is also clear let's move on to question number 10 